So good to see you this morning. I can tell you there is no place I would rather be than right here with all of you this morning. You know, whenever Elvis Presley would finish a concert, he would exit the stage and the crowd would typically cheer wildly, hoping that he would come back and do an encore. That's when eventually a voice would come over the loudspeaker that would say, Elvis has left the building. I want to use that phrase this morning as a jumping off point for what we're going to talk about. Because we have to understand as Christians that Jesus leaves the building. Yes, he's here when we gather because this is his church. We are all purchased members of his body. This is a blood-bought institution, and every one of us were purchased with his own blood. However, Jesus didn't just hang around the temple all the time. The apostles didn't build a church and expect everyone to show up. To be a follower denotes movement. And so if we want to be as they did in the first century, be as they were and do as they did, then we've got to move as well. We've got to be a church that is outgoing. Think about it like this. Many moons ago in football, there used to be this thing called a huddle. You don't see it as much anymore with the uh, hurry-up offenses now. But usually a team would huddle before the play. The quarterback would come into the encircled group of teammates and he would call out a play and they would break the huddle and they would go to the line of scrimmage to execute the play. Now, huddling was crucial because that's where you got the play, right? Imagine how chaotic it would be and how unsuccessful a team would be if everybody went up to the line of scrimmage with just kind of their own plan. Everybody did their own thing as soon as the ball would snap. That would be a very unsuccessful team, to say the least. So huddling is vitally important. However, huddling is not all that's involved in the game. No fan comes to watch a football team huddle. They expect them to eventually break the huddle and go execute the game plan. Huddling is a means to an end. And look, folks, I love our huddles in the church. I love this right here. This is our huddle, right? And, and I love our huddles. This is where life happens. This is where worship happens. This is where education and edification and encouragement and fellowship happens. And unlike huddles in football, worship is not a means to an end. It is the end. Worship is never something that is like a, a, a passing through a door onto something else, right? This is not about pursuing something bigger. This is it. This is the means right here. This is the goal. And nothing else that we do is like that. I mean, Christian education isn't like that. You're going to Bible class after church, and, and, and that's, that's not uh, the goal. Christian education is, is uh, pursuing information for the purpose of transformation, right? But just gathering information isn't the goal. Fellowship is a means to an end. It's not the goal. Fellowship, and the, the goal of fellowship is getting together, but the goal of it is to grow closer together in the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. And evangelism is not the goal. There is a means to an end involved in evangelism, right? So we go so that we hopefully can bring others to Christ and help them grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. However, when it comes to huddling, we have to understand that not everything just happens here. That church isn't just something that happens in a pew twice a week at a building at an agreed upon time. That there's more to it than just that. That at some point we have to break the huddle and we have to go and execute the game plan. Someone once said that we don't need a fasten your seatbelt sign above our pews because we no longer fly. Ouch. We're like a group of geese attending meetings every Sunday where we talk passionately about flying and then we get up and we walk home. No team ever won a game by huddling. Huddling's important. It's vital, in fact. It's just not all that is involved with being the church. God has always called his people to a work that involves sending. Being the church and being a Christian cannot be confined to a pew. And here's why. First of all, pews don't move. It's unnatural for a pew to move on its own. However, it's also unnatural for a living body not to move on its own. 
Throughout Scripture, we see that faithfulness is compared to a walk. That's Psalm 1 and 1, Colossians 3 and 7, 1 John 1 and 17. Christ commanded us to go. As a fisherman myself, I have found that probably the best way to catch fish is to get in a boat and troll over to an area where there's grass or, or brush or somewhere where you can get closer to try to catch the fish. But you can also stand on a dock and expect the fish to come to you. And I think some Christians have done that by sitting in the pew, but the, the fish stopped biting a long time ago. Pews don't grow. Healthy bodies grow. If we're not careful, we can hinder our growth through confinement. You will never reach your full potential as a Christian simply by sitting in a pew. Growth and maturity cannot be confined to the pew. Church is important. In fact, it is vital. But again, it's not something that only happens at the building. Also, pews don't care. You can't develop a relationship with a pew, although some have tried. Some get very territorial about their pew. And, and just so we're clear going forward, you don't own a pew here, okay? So that's not your pew. If you come in one Sunday and somebody's sitting in it, that's okay. How dare we ruin an opportunity because we get too territorial about our pews? May we never be so comfortable in the pew that we don't step out. Your pew doesn't care about you. They don't care. It's easy for a pew to create distance between our brothers and sisters. Jesus could not be contained, and he would never be confined to a pew. He reached out to those who were hurting. He listened to people. He was compassionate. He mingled with those who needed him. He touched people. And if we want to be like Jesus, then we must leave the pew, and we must connect with people. And finally, pews don't last. They're temporary. They don't stand the test of time. They are material in nature, but souls are eternal. And may we never get so focused on bodies in the pew that we forget that this is about souls in the kingdom. What we're building spiritually is much more important than what we're building physically. Church isn't a place. It's a people. This isn't just an organization. This is an organism. Yeah, you know, we do have to have organization to some degree, and we could be more like a robot, but the thing about robots is that they, they don't have life. That's the thing that sets an organization off from an organism. An organism lives and breathes and moves. There's a function. That's the biggest difference. And so, as an organism, let's live and let's breathe and let's move and let's grow and let's, let's develop. Look with me at Colossians chapter 1. I appreciate Jimmy reading from here a moment ago. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now notice verse 18 and following. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So to get the context here, Paul is addressing the problem of false teachers who were teaching things kind of like asceticism and angel worship. They were pushing these doctrines that were really nothing more than human philosophy or self-made religion. And so Paul's goal is to debunk these false teachers by approaching the Colossae Christians and telling them to remain faithful, not to fall prey to what is being taught that is a different gospel. And he gives Jesus' resume. He reminds them of who Jesus is. He reminds them also in the process of who they are. And not only who they are, but who they were before Christ. And that's interesting, right? Because you would think that if someone were trying to debunk these false teachers, that they would start by, you know, better arguments. Uh, that's kind of what we think as Christians sometimes, that we have it figured out because we have better arguments, we have better theology, we have better politics, whatever. But Paul doesn't start there. Paul starts with Jesus and the gospel 
And he reminds them of Jesus in the gospel. He reminds them of who they are as a result of obeying the gospel and who they were before they obeyed the gospel. And so he starts with who Jesus is, then he turns to who they were and also who they are now and before they were a Christian. Notice what he says. You were formerly alienated. You were hostile in mind. You were engaged in evil deeds, now reconciled, holy and blameless, beyond reproach. And so Paul is appealing to their identity, and he's reminding them of Jesus and what he has done and who they are because of it. They were a new creation. They had been empowered to live a new kind of life. And as Paul is spelling all of this out, he throws this into the mix. He says, he, Jesus, is also the head of the body, the church. Now, why is that significant? Because it's a reminder that without Jesus, there is no organism. Without Jesus, there is no church. There's no reason for you to be here. There's no reason for you to take on a daily Bible reading plan. There's no real reason for you to pray. There's no real reason for you to live a godly life because without Jesus, this is all for naught. It's kind of like when a rattlesnake has its head removed. When I was living in Abilene, Texas, I rattlesnake hunted. There was a lot of rattlesnakes, no shortage of rattlesnakes in Texas. In fact, you can, you can probably go on and, uh, on Google and probably uh, search uh, Texas preacher and rattlesnake, and you will find a story that happened with me and the youth minister as we were leaving the church building. A large rattlesnake had crawled up and laid across the threshold of the door, which happened quite often, and almost bit me. It curled up and was rattling, and there's a picture of it, a video of it, and, and the, uh, the story went viral. It made news stations in like Chicago and other places, and all because, you know, of this, uh, this scary rattlesnake. In fact, the news station locally came out and did a story, and Blake, our youth minister, reenacted the story for them, and he said, you know, he acted really goofy in the story. And he said, y'all will cut that out, right? And they said, oh, yeah, we can edit it. Well, they didn't, so it appeared on the local news. The interesting thing about that is we went to get a shovel because that's how you kill a rattlesnake. They were building onto our building, and so we ran down to the construction workers and asked for a shovel, and one gentleman wanted to come and kill the snake himself because he was going to eat it, and that guy's name was Jesus, so take that for what it worth. Yeah, kind of an interesting caveat to the story. So if you remove the head of a rattlesnake, this is what I was getting at, if you remove the head of the rattlesnake, the body will still move, sometimes for an hour, but it's not going anywhere, and it's not any danger to you because it doesn't have a head. It's just aimless, and that's who we would be without Christ, the head of the church. So if the church only finds meaning and purpose in its connection to the head, and the head is Jesus Christ, then what does that naturally assume? Well, it assumes that we as the body are controlled by the head, and the head of the church was sent. God's sending resulted in our saving. So if we truly care about aligning our lives with the head, then we've got to follow his lead. Paul wrote these words, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That, my friends, is the goal. To have more of him expressed in less of me. Let me say that again. The goal is to have more of Jesus expressed through less of me. So his words, his will, and his way become my walk. You know, if you care anything about college football, you know that recruiting is big business, especially now that you have the NIL stuff and the transfer portal. I heard the other day that in order for a big school to get a quarterback, they have to pay at least about $2 million. It's big business. And college coaches have always gone to great lengths in order to land their prized recruit. It's been said that Jim Harbaugh, the, the coach of Michigan, climbed a tree one time to impress a recruit. He even had a sleepover with one of his recruits. Bo Pelini wrestled one of his potential recruits in the living room of the young man's home. Uh, many college coaches will do whatever it takes within reason to land that prized recruit. Jesus has a recruiting pitch. You want to hear it? 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Sign me up, right? That sounds exciting. Jesus is the greatest recruiter of all time. Notice I didn't say the most successful. Because not everyone through the years has joined him in his mission. Many people choose to play for another coach because he's a lot more exciting. And his style of play is really exciting. And you want to know his recruiting pitch? His recruiting pitch is this. You surely will not die. That's Satan's recruiting pitch. Satan pulls out all the stops to win a recruit. He's watched film. He's studied your game. He's done his homework. He puts that bait on the, on the hook, and that bait is specifically designed to hook you. He knows the strategy, and it works. To play for the other team means you're going to win a lot of games. And you're going to participate in in an exciting style of play. Satan is a player's coach. And who doesn't love a player's coach? But here's the major difference between the two coaches and the two teams. And I think you know this. Team Jesus is undefeated. He is the Alabama of, of, of the spiritual teams. He doesn't lose. Satan's teams win a lot. They might win their conference. They might win a bowl game. But they will never win the big game, ever. How would you like that? You you, you join a team thinking you're going to be successful, but you know from the very beginning you will never win the biggest game, ever. It's kind of like when I was coaching. There was a a school close to us that won 29 games in the regular season. They were 29-0 and in basketball, and they lost in the first round of the playoffs. Their, Their season, they felt, was an utter failure. Because it doesn't matter how many games you win in the regular season if you lose the last one, right? Our coach used to always tell us there's only one team happy at the end of the year. How would you like to know that you're going to win some games, but you'll never win the biggest game? But conversely, how would you like to know that no matter what happens along the way, no matter how many losses you may have to endure, you ultimately will raise the trophy. If you commit to his will and his way, you are victorious in the end. Jesus recruits us to join him in his mission. He invites us to realign our lives to his will. And this is vitally important for us to comprehend as disciples that it's not just about life insurance. When you become a child of God, that's not just a fire insurance policy. You are partnering with God. You are partnering with Jesus in his mission. This isn't list living. You know what list living is? Many Christians have been guilty of it. Maybe you are as well. And if so, please, please change your lifestyle. List living is I come to church, check. I read my Bible, check. I pray, check. I follow all the rules, check. Therefore, I'm good. This is not about list living because this is not a rule book. This defines a relationship. And if you are in relationship with the head, when you realign your life, when you reorient your life to his will and his way, his cause, his mission, then you enjoy victory in the end. When you have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer about you but Christ who lives in you, then the rest is just kind of elementary. It all falls into place. Why don't you take Stephen, for example. Stephen was the first Christian martyr that we read about. He certainly wouldn't be the last, but he realigned his life to the mission of Jesus, surrendering to him completely, all the way to the point of death. Here's what happened to Stephen after calling out the religious elite. Now, when they had heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being, fully, uh, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. And I think you probably catch this with just a cursory read. You see a striking resemblance between Stephen and Jesus. Something we've talked about over and over again, that many times in the Bible you find Messiah-like individuals who don't quite live up to the standard of Jesus the Messiah, but they have certain qualities. And of course, they're all pointing to the perfect Messiah who would come. They're foreshadowing to the Messiah who would come. And Stephen is like that. I mean, his words here are very reminiscent of Jesus' words on the cross. You know, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then we see that Stephen is someone who, because he aligned his life with Christ, then the natural outcome would be one of victory. You know, even though none of us will face the fear of death for preaching the gospel, we do have to face the consequences of not doing so. I mean, what are the ramifications of you not sharing the gospel with those closest to you? Think about that. What are the ramifications of you not sharing the gospel with your, your mother or your father who may not be a Christian or your brother or sister or maybe a coworker? If that coworker or friend doesn't have you to share the gospel with them, will they ever hear the good news? You may be the only Bible they ever read. You may be the best sermon that they ever hear preached. You see, our greatest threat is not death. It's apathy. It's Christians who want a convenient Jesus. They want the Lord to rescue them, but they don't want to do any rescuing. And yet, where would we be today without the efforts of another Christian? It's just a fact that most Christians become Christians because of other Christians. Somebody saw you as worth the time and effort and energy. And so it's time to pay that forward. Move ahead in Acts chapter 9, and we find another man who is mentioned actually in the account of Stephen. Look at verses 1 and following of chapter 9 of Acts. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that it... If he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. So Saul was persecuting the church, but in the process, he was persecuting Christ himself. And the resurrected Messiah appears to Saul and tells him to go into the city. He'll be told what he must do, but he allowed the resurrected Jesus to recruit him to the mission. He realigned his life to fall under the head of Jesus, and it changed the entire tenor and tone. He went from being a persecutor to a proclaimer. Have you aligned your life with Christ? Have you oriented your life to where He is your north star, where He is your compass, to where everything you do is connected to Him? That's where we start. We get efforts wrong in evangelism because we start with programs and with strategies that are mostly good, but we start with the head. Are you aligned with the head? Are you living at the center of his will? You ever have a a merry-go-round on the playground when you were growing up? You don't see these death contraptions very much anymore, but I used to love them. They were hot as blue blazes in the summertime, so you'd better be careful if you're wearing shorts. But that was one of the, the, you know, the draws of recess is you would go out and you'd always have some crazy kids like myself who would wrap their legs around one of the poles and hang halfway off as somebody spun you as fast as you could go so you could receive maximum G-force, right? And it wasn't really uh, you know, exciting until somebody threw up. And so I can remember vividly my days of playing on the playground, getting on the merry-go-round and having three or four people run as fast as they could to make you go as fast as you could go. If you wanted to be more stable, if you wanted to be safer, what would you do on the merry-go-round? You would move to the center, wouldn't you? 
because the center is where you had more stability and where you were safer. And the same is true with our lives. Life is spinning fast for most of us. And it's probably not going to slow down in time for you to get off. So what do you do? You move to the center where there's stability, where Jesus is. And you live at the center so the merry-go-round, no matter how fast it's going, doesn't affect you and your responsibility and your life because you're connected at the center. Some people move to the center, but it's the wrong center. The center is not your job or money or even your spouse or your kids. The center is always Jesus Christ because you get him right, you get everything right. Everything else just kind of falls into place. And so if you want to survive and thrive, you're going to have to focus on the core and the constant, which is Christ. Stability is found in drawing nearer to him. I want to close this morning with a challenge. I don't want to just talk about being an outgoing church. I want to leave you with a challenge that we're going to take on, hopefully all of us, through the entire year. I want each and every one of us to invite five people per month. Now, look. I'm not trying to be harsh, but I want to be direct. This is not a 10% thing. Every one of you can do this. It's going to take every one of us. Virtually every one of us can invite people to church. Just a simple come and see. That's what Jesus did, right? Come and see. So invite people. Come and see. We've got welcome cards on the welcome desk. Grab some of those. Hand them out to people. But five people per month. Maybe none of the five answer your invitation, but you've, did what, you've done what you were supposed to do, right? So we're going to invite five people per month. So if you hand them a card or if you invite them to church, also give them your phone number so that after they come to church or when they come to church, you know, they can ask questions and you can answer them. Now, please hear me again. I'm not trying to be harsh, just direct. Give them your number. Don't give them my number. Don't give them Chad's number. I think too many times churches see the responsibility of evangelism falling on the preacher or the, uh, uh, the, the connections minister. Now, we're building a culture of evangelism here that all of us are involved in. Don't give them my number. Don't give them Chad's number. Give them your number. And when they call to ask questions or to set up a Bible study, guess who's going to do the Bible study with them? Not Chad, you. You're going to do the Bible study. Now, that does not mean that myself or Chad or any of the other ministers are not willing to help. We will equip you and we will help you in any way we can because ultimately we want to see a soul saved. But you're going to do the Bible study because, again, this is a culture of evangelism and the evangelistic efforts are not just going to be left to a few ministers or the elders. This is going to be on you. And then when you do the Bible study with them and they want to be baptized, guess who's going to baptize them? You are. Because you're going to take ownership in this. Because this is about each one reach one. Every single one of us seeking to save the lost. And you know why we're doing this? Because the Bible tells you you're supposed to do this. If we're going to be biblical, then this is the most biblical, one of the most biblical things we could do. Each one reach one, each one of us involved in the evangelistic process, developing a culture of evangelism here so that people know in our community that we are an outgoing church and that we're not some ivory tower that just sits inside and conducts our business and never reaches out to anyone. That's not who we are. That's not who we've been, and it's not who we're going to be going forward. Everyone invite five people per month and see where it goes. We're here to help you. We're not leaving you on your own. We're not throwing you to the wolves. We will help you in any way possible to equip you, but we want you to take the lead. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity, for a new year. May we, as the Walnut Street Church of Christ, seek to live under the head, to realign our lives and reorient our lives to you and your will, your cause, and your mission. God, you have given us a message and a mandate, and may we take it and spread it. We love you, God, and we thank you so much. And it's in your Son's precious name we pray. Amen. So. Can we help you this morning? 
If we're going to be effective in our evangelistic efforts, we need to be right with God ourselves. Are you right with God? Because there's no reason for you to leave here this morning without being right with God. Can we help you? Can we pray with you? Can we study with you? Are you ready to put on Christ in baptism? Whatever your need is, come as we stand.